hello, hello. There we go. Don't forget the legendary clap. And... Clap. Oh, yeah. And we are back again. Hold on. And we are back again. I just got to get my levels right. With the ATP Podcast... It's your boy Jay here with Fig GPT, the legendary AI that covers all things tennis. Um, and we've got a, a pretty good week. This is, this lines up really good with the tour, right? Yes, it does. There's a, a lot to talk about for sure. Madrid, uh, the Italian Open just started. A lot of the drama in Madrid, plus a lot of rule changes, all that stuff. It'll be an entertaining uh, episode for sure. Obviously, we usually start with the WTA. Where do we start today? Yes, we're going to start with the Met Gala. So Serena, <clears throat> Sharapova, and uh, Venus were at the Met Gala. And uh, of the three, a lot of people were raving about how Venus looked. Okay. Uh, okay. Serena, they were saying, uh, no. It, it, it looked as if she was wearing a very poofy dress. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I'm not a fashionista. Yeah. But that's what was uh, said about uh, the dresses. Okay. Yes. And uh, anyway, uh, would you like to add something before I keep going? I mean, they've all had their highs and lows at the Met Gala as far as the the ladies go. Serena and Venus are their icons of the WTA. So they've been to the Met Gala countless times. So yeah, I mean, the Met Gala is where you, you dress extravagantly experimental and risky and you do interesting things. And so, yeah, I don't expect people to like everything they wear every year. So I think we should definitely put at least one of them in their outfits as our thumbnail for this episode. Okay. And our cover art. Uh, I was thinking Ega, but you do you. Uh, we can put them both. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, thank you if you're watching on YouTube. Like, subscribe, comment, share, anything else I should be saying. That's pretty much it. Um, support in whatever way you can. Even if you hate us, <laughs> tell us. <laughs> so uh, Serena wore a gold Balenciaga. Okay. Uh, okay. Venus. That sounds expensive. Uh, Venus wore a Marc Jacobs gown covered in tiny mirrors. Oh, um, so and, definitely and, out of my budget. Yes, and that was it, 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 it looked very fitting on her body. It just looked mm. really good. Okay. Yes, and then Sharapova, Sharapova excuse me, wore a neon green um, gown. Mm. So that's what they were wearing. Okay. Yes, and, and again, the Met Gala theme was... Uh, Oh jeez, I forgot I forgot it already. It's like but, a earthly yes, something, earthly yeah. heaven or something yeah. along those lines. So time on earth, something like that. Yes, so that was the theme. Mm-hmm. So uh, anything else you'd like to add? No, uh, I to be totally honest with you, I don't keep up with the Met Gala stuff too closely. But I do like to before we do these episodes, look up what our pro tennis players wore. We've seen. Felix has been there. Feder has been there multiple times. A lot of the the prestigious players on the men's side as well have also made appearances. So I'm always curious to see who wore what for the tennis people. Yes. Yeah, so the, sorry, I found it. The Met Gala theme was Garden of Time. Garden of Time. I was yes. close. I was close. Yes. Yeah, so that was a uh, pretty much the Met Gala. Mm-hmm. But now the big one is Iga's kit for the French Open. Mm, uh, kit talk. Yes. Kit talk. Exactly. So she is wearing uh, to me sort of a different color. A uh, kit uh-huh. normally it's just a white or black with a pink stripe yeah. on it, but it has various colors in it. It's like a gradient, right? It's right. like a transitioning color. Yes, yeah. and uh, the reviews are not good on uh, social media. Mm. But you've seen the kit. What do you think of the new uh, Ons kit for Ega? I didn't think it was that bad. Um, I don't look to On for how awesome looking any of their clothes are. I don't think that on knocks it out of the park in general with anything that makes me want to break the bank. But I thought that this was on brand for on. I thought it was decent. I don't think it looks that bad. The image we saw is just a billboard that only shows Iga's hat and her top. So we can't really speak to the entire outfit. But from what I saw, it looks it looks decent. It looks average. It doesn't look like it garners a polarizing opinion. You know, it looks very traditional. It but, almost looks like a high school jersey. But to me, on it's, it's as I said, it's very just white with a pink stripe on. The, they're it. normally very plain. Yeah, so yeah. it's not as if it's over the top either. Yeah. But here, are some of the uh, <clears throat> things on social media said about the gown. Okay. They're a horrible, extremely boring kit. Mm-hmm. Um. 
Sorry to say, but I see nothing interesting on on about this kit. Quite the opposite, in fact. Uh, it is. It looks more the same, like a bland at best. Yeah, I mean that. That's kind of what I was just speaking to. Do are these people thinking that on has polarizing outfits in general? Right. I don't recall anything from on that made me go, "Holy smokes, I need to switch brands from Nike to this." You know. <laughs> so I've never, I've never been blown away by what they make. So I'm a little surprised by people's reactions. They're. They're a little odd. Yes, exactly. On in general is somewhat bland. Sorry. So, so what are your thoughts about the kits in general lately? Do you think that oh. they're kind of bl- on the blandish side compared to uh, maybe 2010? No, I, I'm not going to call them bland, but I think kits in general are in a slump. I think that tennis, tennis clothing looks horrendous on average. I think most players... You think to yourself when they walk on that court, I, I hope they're getting a check for wearing that. <laughs> you know, like, uh, I mean, the first people that come to mind are like Tiafo. Right. He, he looks insane when he walks on the court sometimes. The clothes don't look like real outfit. It doesn't look real. It looks like a, a joke, like someone, he's like a humiliation ritual or something. Um, I remember in the 2010s, I remember Dimitrov, Taylor Fritz, Zverev. Obviously, Federer and Nadal, all of them had outfits that were pretty sick. You know, um, stuff that made you go, okay, I got to get online. Uh, Dominic team was coming out in bomber jackets. Yes. Federer was coming out in uh, like Asian collared shirts that were like uh, an exotic polo almost. Nadal had the coolest shorts on the tour. You know, he, when he transitioned from baggy to more fitted, his shorts were really nice. Yes, exactly. Um yeah, I mean, I just remember there being some... Zverev had the really cool shirts. They didn't look the best on him, but Zverev was running, wearing some shirts that I thought were really sick back in the day. And now, I don't really see anything on the tour that I want to go purchase. Yes. You know, especially paying a premium for it. And we could even go as far as talking about how they discontinued the Vapor uh, for a little bit, and they buckled and brought it back now. But what were they thinking? You know, um, and this isn't one brand. This is several brands making mistakes, so... Yeah, I, I don't know what's going on with kits, merchandise, branding of tennis outside of the court with clothing. What is going on? I don't know. As a matter of fact, uh, <clears throat> Grigor a couple of years ago, maybe seven, eight years now, uh, wore pajamas. Uh, <laughs> he, he had the shirt and then he had pants and the sweater that went with the shirt. Mm-hmm. And it was horrific. Yeah. Uh, I got the shirt. I'll probably wear it so you guys know what I'm referring to. Mm-hmm. But I, I was all, there's no way I'm wearing those pants and the jacket. Yeah. It was, it was like a repeated sequence, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, where, yes. <coughs> excuse me. You can't wear that all at once. No, no. It's too loud. So <coughs> now we're going to get into Kendrick Lamar, uh, Drake feud. Oh. So uh, Osaka was asked about the feud Uh-oh. at the Italian Open. Uh-oh. And then she said, uh, what are your thoughts on the feud? Mm. She said that she's been going out listening to the Kendrick Lamar uh, song that was released on May 4th, mm-hmm. which is called Not Like Us. Mm-hmm. So she said she's been listening to that. Mm. And then, uh, obviously, Drake responded with uh, The Heart Part 6. Mm-hmm. And then she was asked, uh, Osaka, mm-hmm. do you think that Kendrick should answer to Drake's diss track? Mm-hmm. Uh, Osaka replied, I think he did a phenomenal job. I try to stay neutral, but mm-hmm. I am a Kendrick Lamar fan, and I would like to see him respond to the heart part six. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on Osaka's comment on this feud? Um <sighs> All right, I'll, I'll tell you two different answers. Answer number one, I think it's hilarious that she chose Kendrick Lamar and is playing it to get amped up or whatever she's doing to get in the mood for tennis. And it's interesting to hear people like Naomi Osaka, who's kind of a softer, timid uh, personality, talk about beef records and diss tracks. So that's entertaining to think about. But being realistic... I don't want to hear her opinion about any of this stuff. I don't care about it. I don't think her opinion has any value whatsoever when it comes to this. But it's fun to think about. It is fun to hear. So I get it. But 
Naomi Osaka's opinion on beef diss tracks sounds insane. <laughs> she gave a full blown answer, by the way. Well, let's keep in mind. I don't know her relationship status with uh, the father of her baby, uh, Corday, but he is a rap recording artist. And um, that's what people on social media were saying. Why are you asking her this question? Because the baby daddy is a rapper. Yeah. If it wasn't for that, would you be asking this question to her? That's relevant. That's a good question. Um, and I also wonder if she's talking to him about this and if there's any influence there. That's a good point. Um, so, I mean, I don't want to dig too deep in this. I'm a, I'm a music nerd when it comes to this stuff. So I have my conspiracy theories and stuff already about this topic. But I'll spare the listeners because this is a tennis podcast. But if I had to tell you who Corday's closest affiliations were with, it is Kendrick Lamar. Okay, there you go. Yeah. So, so uh, and before we go on, uh, more tennis news. Mm-hmm. Uh, Drake was dissing Serena and her husband. Mm-hmm. And in this new track, Kendrick mentions Serena and says, stop dissing him pretty much. Yeah. Alexis Ohanian. Yeah. So that's what he said in this new track, which is... Uh, not like us. Mm-hmm. So it is kind of tennis related. Yeah, it's, it's got a little relevance. Yes, exactly. So, <clears throat> excuse me. We're going to talk about the biggest match now, which is obviously the Madrid final. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people are um, just talking about it, raving about the excellence of the match. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, the pundits on Tennis Channel um, are saying this is the big FU for the lack of respect that the women got last year. Mm -hmm. As you know, they didn't get to speak in the women's uh, doubles final. But now uh, the match was amazing. Uh, Did you see it at all? I did. It. I mean, the build up for this even was amazing. But Iga, you're talking about Iga Sabalenka, right? Correct. Yeah, that that was a roller coaster of a match. Great tennis, drama. I mean, she was defending match points. This this was a good one. And yeah, I think this demands respect. This was a good opportunity for, if you're not a WTA person, this was a match to watch to make you one. Yes. Sure. Um, I, I looked at the match carefully. I thought that um, Iga did a lot of unforced errors. But now that I really looked at it a little bit more closely, I the, the reason why she did was because Sabalenka forced her to hit shots that she's not accustomed to hit. Mm-hmm. So, and if she didn't hit those shots, Sabalenka was going to be on the offensive. Mm-hmm. So I did see that. Forced errors, essentially. Yeah, forced errors. Yes, yeah. Iga was going down the line very, very quickly. Mm-hmm. And that's not a shot that she's accustomed to hitting. Mm-hmm. Now, I will I will say that she uh, Iga did try to change direction uh, into the inside out forehand a lot Mm. and she just kept getting jammed a little bit so she was missing a lot of forehands Mm -hmm. but i did see that uh sabalenka is at the same time she had the two match points and she tried uh going down the line real quick Mm -hmm. and she kept missing wide as well Mm -hmm. so i felt that there were forced errors and it was just a really really good match yeah so um Okay, so now I'm going to go with, uh, I'm going to leave that alone for a little bit, Mm. and I'm going to go to Danielle Collins. Uh Uh-oh. So Danielle Collins said, who would have thought a granny like me could win 15 matches in a row? Mm. Okay, what are your thoughts about um, Collins saying that? Calling herself a granny is so lame. Come on. You are an elite professional athlete. You are not a granny. I don't like that, but I get where she's coming from. Who would have thought someone that wasn't on anyone's radar could figure it out like this at the last second? I I respect that, but she's not that old. She what she's, she's yeah what she's doing is totally doable <laughs> for someone her age. She's a pro athlete. She's got dog in her. She has a fighter spirit. This is normal. She's just meeting her potential. So shout out to you. You're not a grandma. And I love what you're doing. You know, keep doing it. Now, let's say let's take it for what it is. Let, let's say that she is saying she is a granny. What does that mean to the WTA that a granny, quote unquote, won 15 matches in a row? It's hard for me to respond to this because I just don't agree with it. But what I will say is this. I think that we can recognize from Danielle Collins' run 
that after the big quote unquote three slash four ish, five ish, there is a significant drop off. Um, there is a huge drop off in the level of competition, and da- Danielle Collins has exposed it. She's gone, okay, if I really, really dial in, I can take out pretty much the top five through 50. And she's proven it. And I think that this should be a wake-up call to other women on the tour that if you really dial in and do what you need to do, this could be you. Yes, I agree. Uh, yeah. She's playing at a high level, and uh, I just think she's just trying to be funny. Yeah, she, sure. she knows what she's doing. She's yes. playing the game. Yes, for sure. Mm-hmm. So now uh, going back to the match, I don't know if you knew this, but Sabalenka spent 12 hours total on court in the Madrid Open, which is the most she's ever spent in a tournament in her career. Say that uh, Say that statistic one more time for me. I was writing a note. So, uh, Sabalenka spent over 12 hours Oof, on court 12. Okay. Uh, at the Madrid Open, mm. which is the most she's ever spent in a tournament in her career. Yeah. And as you know, it doesn't change because they play two out of three in Masters 1000, slams, two out of three yeah. in Slams. So, what do you think of that stat? Do you think that she was spent going into facing Iga? It didn't look like it. Uh, I can say that for sure. I watched the match. She didn't look spent. But what I can say is her play style um, on clay, she's going to have to hit a few more shots than she's probably used to in a lot more rallies. And I think that this is a huge sign of progress for her, that she grinded her way to a clay court final um, with her play style and spent that much time on court. It just shows that she's finding her level. She's finding her consistency. And... I think that spending that much time on court and getting this far and doing this well, is, everything looks good. If you're Sabalenka, you should take confidence away from that statistic. Yes, I agree. And now here's a very interesting set. I mean, whoa, I, I never thought that this would happen. Mm. So Iga has been in 24 finals. Sabalenka has been in 27 finals total, Masters 1000 in their career. Yeah. This is the first time that they've played a career tiebreaker in a final. Okay. That to me that is insane. Uh, what are hmm. your thoughts on that stat? I think it shows it's the first deciding career uh, tiebreak. First deciding career tiebreak between the two of them. Uh, yes, in in their in their finals in their finals career, not between each other in, in their finals ever. Where the third set went to tiebreak. Correct for either of them ever. Correct. That's crazy. That is a crazy. If that's what the statistic is, that's, that's, is, that's wild. Yes. Yeah. That. I mean, that also speaks to their dominance as well. So that makes a lot of sense that the one time they do is when they go against another member of the big three on the women's side. So, yeah, that's impressive. That's That shows that they win by breaks. Yes. You know, not tiebreakers. That's great. And now Iga is the ninth career, uh, ninth career Master 1000 title of... Uh, so she has nine career Masters 1000s. Mm-hmm. She's the youngest woman to win 20 titles since total, mm-hmm. since Wozniacki in 2012. Okay. She's 32 and four record this year, three titles. Ooh, okay. We're going to we're gonna get to uh, the Rabakina, Sabalenka. Um, yeah, there's a lot to a lot talk about still. there. Yes. And then she is 20 and four in career in finals. She mm-hmm. has won eight straight. What are your thoughts on those stats by Iga? I mean, speaks to her dominance. I love that we're going to have to talk a little bit about how well Rabakina and Sabalenka are doing because it's going to show that this isn't in an empty era as well. So, yeah, these stats are impressive. I I love what's happening with the WTA. My only t- takeaway from everything now is I want a little more depth in the rankings. But this is good. This is good. This is a great step in the right direction. I believe that now with these stats, she is definitely starting to build that. Uh, she needs to do a little more, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably win a Wimbledon uh, or a Australian Open where she really hasn't done well. Mm-hmm. But she's starting to build a portfolio resume to best of all time as of right now. Yeah, get in, get at least in contention. Talk about, make people want to talk about, is she going to reach it or not? Right. She has to do that, yeah. Yes, so she's the first player as well, man or woman, to win 20 titles since the 2000s. Uh, what are your thoughts there? She is on the forefront. She's she's leading the way 
of the newer generation of players to show that someone can dominate and compete with these people who had 20 year careers and really crushed it. Um, men and women, I would say, you know, she's, she's the first to show this much depth right for this long. So she's definitely ahead of the Alcarazes, the sinners, the, I mean, let's not talk about any of the other men and she's become what people wanted Naomi Osaka to be, what they thought maybe a Layla Fernandez or Emirata Khan you could possibly go to. She's showing that she's that person. And I feel like no one was counting on her to be it until she already had a slam. So pretty impressive. Yes, exactly. And then after the match, she said, well, who is going to say now that women's tennis is boring? Hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts there? Do you think that people had the assumption that tennis, uh, women's tennis was boring? Absolutely. I think people still think it. I don't think Iga's changed anyone's mind, <laughs> you know, to be honest with you. I love women's tennis. I think women's tennis is the best women's sport to watch on television. That's my opinion. But ultimately, people still think it, you know. Um, so I think that she's definitely entertained to watch herself. I think she puts on a great show when she plays tennis. I think she's awesome to watch. And I feel where she's coming from, but I don't think she's going to be as convincing. I think Serena changed people's minds. I think Venus changed people's minds. I think Sharapova somehow, don't ex- I, I can't tell you why, I think she changed some people's minds. I haven't seen Iga cut through to the public like that yet. So it'll it'll come with time. Yes, in uh, in that era with Annan, Kleisters, yeah. Sharapova, uh, Serena, and all them, they all had different styles mm-hmm. that made the game great to watch. Yeah, and right now it's starting to get that way as well. Yeah, you have the power player. I don't want to call Iga a quote unquote counter puncher, but uh, she she counters a lot of the pop. Mm-hmm. Sabalenka, she's the she's the one that has the power, but she's not the consistent one. She mm-hmm. will give you a a double fault more often than not. Mm-hmm. And then let's throw in Coco in there as well. She's a consistent starting to get a better serve. So mm-hmm. there's a lot more variety in the women's game that there hasn't been in a while. Yeah. And I mean, something relevant to talk about here is storylines, off court presence, charisma. Those things also make a difference in how fun it is to watch people play because do we care if you win or lose? Right. That's a huge question. You know, um, do people hate you? Because people will watch you to hope you lose. Or do people love you? Are people watching to hope you win? And I think Iga's kind of Switzerland there. She kind of sits neutral in the middle. People don't love her like crazy. People don't hate her either. And I think she's definitely... Her her destiny is to be a beloved champion. Right. You know, that's... The people who do know who she is love her. It's just she's not a superstar yet. She's getting there. So I think Coco's got more of that in her than anything she's got a very present um personality so we'll see what happens as Iga becomes more and more outspoken outgoing and less timid and soft-spoken with the the media and uh just to compare uh with the players that were born in the 2000 Mm -hmm. uh Zbiacic has 20 titles that I just mentioned Alcaraz has 13 Sinner Mm -hmm. has 13 Mm -hmm. and then Coco Goff has seven Mm -hmm. so there's a big separation there. there's a gap there and then most WTA titles, uh, 1,000 events since 2009. You have Serena with 13, Azarenka with 10, Iga has 9, Petra Kvitova has 9, hmm. and Simona Halep has 9. Okay. So She's that's an a pretty, interesting company. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I feel like Iga came a lot, or came after all those players. So that's a pretty cool stat to hear. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. So now, uh, speaking about this Halep, since we just mentioned her, um, Wozniacki was not given a wild card into the Italian Open. Mm-hmm. Neither was Raducanu. Mm-hmm. And the fans were very happy on social media to hear that. They're all, that's perfect. They haven't done much. They're stinking it up. That's great. They have to earn it. Halep was actually given one, mm-hmm. but she rejected it because she said, I'm not fit as what I want to be. Mm-hmm. I want to be a little bit more fit. She even went as far as to say, if I'm not super fit for the French Open, I'm just not going to play. Mm-hmm. And that to me is her, to me, is her best surface. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Wozniacki and Raducanu? 
Wozniacki and Radakanyu. Radakanyu seems to be plagued with just little tidbits of issues here and there. And with Wozniacki, I'll be, I'll be totally honest with you. I have not been watching a lot of her matches. Um, and maybe that also speaks to why she's not getting a, <laughs> an invitation. Um, I don't think people are jumping out of their seats to watch her. And the tournament is going, look, this is the Italian Open. We don't need you guys to fill seats. And they're disinterested. Yes, that is true. So. And, uh, yeah, it, it is too bad. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. But since, uh, let's just talk about it since we're talking about that. We're going to talk about Anne Jabor. Mm. She actually made a very interesting statement. So she said that, l- l- let me just read this part first. So she played uh, Yelena Ostapenko. Mm-hmm. She won. And then on court, she was asked, why do you play well here? Hmm. What motivates you? She responded in French. The conditions and the fact that they annoy me here by favoring men. That's why she plays well. <laughs> what are your thoughts on her response? I love the petty chip on the shoulder response. I love it. Um, I like the personality. And this is the stuff. You know what's funny? If she was doing a better job of winning more matches and being more prominent on the women's tour i think she'd be one of those people who does make people watch but you know she's just struggled a little bit at the big stages and at the slams and so she's not in those conversations but that's the kind of stuff we want to hear and that's the kind of stuff that makes people love or hate you polarizing players and she went as far as to say in europe And especially at the Madrid Open and at the Italian Open, they're very sexist. Mm -hmm. They don't respect women. Mm -hmm. So the comments on social media were, oh, in Saudi Arabia, they respect women. Mm -hmm. So they just went at her for saying that comment. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Feliciano Lopez was quick to respond and said, we tried to learn from our mistakes. We didn't do that this time. Uh, we need to put that in the past and move forward. Mm-hmm. Do you agree with Lopez or do you think uh, Jabor has more beef and is, uh, it's okay for her to say what she said? Look, I think Feliciano Lopez said the right thing, but he's got to deal with the repercussions of their actions, which is there's going to be a little bit of recoil, per se, for the th- mistakes you made just one simple year ago. It's It's not a clean slate that fast. Um, if you guys really give them a great experience this year, now we can talk about making the past the past. Let bygones be got bygones. But we haven't even finished the tournament yet. I'm going to get my frustrations off. I'm going to say what I need to say. I'm going to make you guys understand that it wasn't okay. We're not happy about it. And you're going to feel the repercussions. You know, and when you see a more popular, successful player voice their discontent with something, we've talked about this in the past. It gives players that aren't as successful a platform to say the same. So I'm glad Feliciano Lopez acknowledged their mistake and that they're working towards fixing it. Well, let's see how the tournament completes, and then we can talk after. Yes, I believe that they made the same amount of money this year. Mm-hmm. So I would like to get that uh, checked. Mm-hmm. But yes, I believe that that was the case this year. So there is a step forward. Mm-hmm. But um, a lot of players were saying that the reason for the sexism talk was because they favored the men on the practice courts over the women. Mm -hmm. So the men had priority on the practice courts, excuse me, at Madrid. Mm -hmm. Uh, Women had to go off-site and practice at another designated place. Mm -hmm. So that is why that was brought up. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that they're perpetuating a perception that the people will adopt if you allow them to, you know, if you, if you, the tournaments don't respect women, do you think the fans are going to just magically respect women, you know, but if the tournaments say, Hey, every staggered hour, a different gender is out on court practicing. Do you think fans are going to get mad about it? No, they're just going to accept it and be happy. They're going to watch some men, watch some women. I, th- I see this at the most popular tournament. That's not a grand slam is Indian Wells. Indian Wells has no problem treating women just like men. So what does that tell you? You should probably model your formula behind a successful tournament. Take care of the women. You know, um, there's a reason Serena and Venus came back to Indian Wells. You know, they recognized, hey, this tournament's doing the right things. This tournament seems to be a good experience for all the players on the tour. We're willing to finally come around 
and give it another shot. And I think that these tournaments are running the risk of having some players not want to come anymore. Um, and they'll opt out. So we'll see. Yes. Yeah, so they were paid the same this year. Okay, good. good. So that's a, a right step at, in the right direction. But let's talk about that. I was going to bring this up a little later, but it, 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 coins, it coins this. Mm-hmm. So um, Indian Wells has a ton of courts. Mm-hmm. Uh, these smaller Masters 1000s, they don't have the court space that Indian Wells does. Yeah. So they need to be able to get the revenue to do so. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, doubles teams were not uh, able to practice as much either. Mm-hmm. So that's a problem for sure. Yeah. So now let's talk about uh, the doubles players. So there was a new formula in the doubles uh, format. They are favoring more single slots than the doubles. Mm-hmm. They're playing in the second week of the tournament. Mm-hmm. I will get to that in a bit. And uh, there's a uh, the speed clock is a lot faster. Mm-hmm. And the sit down time is a lot faster. Mm. And they're thinking that this. So Shanda Rubin was asked, what are your thoughts about this? Mm. And her response was, yes, double slots are getting taken away from double specialists. Mm-hmm. But if you see it half full, the singles players are bringing the attention to the doubles. Mm-hmm. Courier was even saying uh, doubles play gets 20% of the total purse and they're not worth that 20%. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on those comments? Look, tennis media... Uh, this is a heavy, this is a long, heavy topic that yes, I could go we in can on go for, for a, for a long while. time. I'm going to try to give you a very short, compact version of it, okay? Um, is doubles entertaining to watch? Yes. Is doubles lacking in the media department? Yes. Is doubles on television easy to watch? No. Um, does media, television airtime... And storyline narratives and things like that alter whether or not people want to watch people play. 1,000% yes. Um, Do doubles players make as much money as singles players? No. But is it because media doesn't cover them the same? People don't talk about them the same? They're not put in a position to get attention and sell tickets? That's the actual source of the issue. And I think that we've kind of dug a hole for doubles players where they... They no longer have clout on the tour, and it's unfortunate, but that's just what it is. They play no ad scoring. They don't do press conferences. They don't like there's so much wrong with the way they treat doubles, considering. Here's another thing. I've been to pro tournaments, right? When I go to a pro tournament, how many of the fans actually know anything about tennis in the crowd? I would say more than half don't know what the hell they're watching. Uh, they don't fully understand the game. They don't fully understand the score. Some of them don't even know when a player won the point or not. But for that kind of person, what do you think is more fun to watch? Singles or doubles? For that average viewer that's buying a ticket, doubles is more fun to watch. So for me, I really think that it's it's really a, a misstep the way the tour treats doubles players. I think there's a lot of money being left on the table. I think that doubles players are more fun for the average ticket buyer. I think doubles players, if we did add scoring, extended the matches, gave them more time, we would see more consistent champions on the tour. And I think that people would enjoy it a lot more if media covered what's going on out there. We talk about how the Bryan brothers, one of them basically knocked out the other one on court, live on television, and no one knew about it. Right. (laughs) You know, like, and that would have got so many clicks and engagement. It would have been viral on the internet, but it just went under the rug because no one pays attention. So, yeah. Do I think singles players would still fill more seats? Yes. Singles players are fun to watch. They have storylines. We know where we know we know the love triangles of singles players. We know when they switch coaches. We know when they go on vacation. We know everything about singles players. How much coverage do we see for doubles? That's true. Not enough. Um so I don't want to dig too much deeper into this, but I genuinely do think that doubles could do better. Um, I I dislike the trend and the downward spiral that we're putting the doubles tour on. And I hope there's reform down the road at some point for it. For the most part, doubles is relatable to the fan. 
Yeah. Because they would rather play doubles more than singles. Yeah, and the recreational level. In the recreational yeah, level. Absolutely. So why not give a little more attention to them? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, th- this is this is something that just can keep going on forever. Yeah. But I'm gonna read the the new rules. So again, uh up to sixteen slots reserved for a thirty two team draw. Mm-hmm. So 16 slots automatically reserved for the singles players. Now, here's the thing, too. I don't know if this is considered a singles and a doubles player because Varev and Monte Carlo played with Marcelo Mello. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that that slot is for the singles player only. You, you, see, you understand yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, I see what you mean when they hybrid the team. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't think it's fair. I think it should be more 10 mm-hmm. slots. I think that the doubles players should get a little more slot play in the masters 1000 yeah because they would have to be ranked top 16 in order to be able to play in the masters 1000 yeah if not they're not going to play so how is that really fair to the doubles team that that's what they do yeah so i think that's unfair Uh, um again it's going to be covered in the second week of the tournament once the tournament is starting to die down and a lot of singles players are getting eliminated Mm -hmm. now the doubles tournament will be ran Mm-hmm. So that's that. I'm going to get to that in a bit. Then you got the reduced clock, as I stated. Uh, it goes to 15 seconds instead of 30. Now, what are your thoughts on that before I give you mine? I don't like it. I don't like shortened clocks. I, I feel like I feel like matches are rolling already. I feel like there wasn't a timing or pace issue. I'm a little surprised by that. And also, don't we think doubles actually is the time where there is chatter? There is time needed to discuss tactics and stuff like that. It's a little weird to to trim everything up, you know, and basically tell them get on the court and get off the court is what's going on. I'm not a fan. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be 15 seconds for for rallies, four shots or less. Mm-hmm. But my thing is, uh, doubles is about talking to your partner. Right. What's the next strategy? How are you going to serve to them? Uh, mm-hmm. What what angle are you going to cut off? So that's kind of rushed to me. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't like that one either. Yeah. And then again, fewer sit downs uh, during changeovers. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that? Sitting down on changeovers for doubles, I get why there'd be less because it is less physically demanding. So I'm not mad at that, but I really, really dislike the less time to communicate between points. I think that is a slap in the face of a doubles player in general. Um, we've all been coached. If you've ever had an actual real tennis coach and played competitive tennis, you've been taught to, even if you have nothing to say, a little bit of chatter between each point. Make sure your opponent understands you're strategizing, you're saying something to your partner, um, or just mental reset. Talk to your partner to clear your mind. Talk to your partner for your morale. Find your sanity. Um, they're, they're really just, I don't want to use bad language on YouTube, so I'm just going to say they're really disrespecting tennis. Oh, yes. Uh, I don't like it. The people making these decisions can't be tennis players. They can't be. And it's as you stated, why is Indian Wells beloved? Yeah. They have all those courts. People love to see these spectacular doubles teams being uh, formed. Mm -hmm. And they have the court space. So instead of cutting it down, they need to build the revenue from the people coming in Mm -hmm. in order to expand the tournament a little more. So there could be more uh, practice courts for the women. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, more doubles uh, being played. Yeah. So it is what it is there. So we're going to talk to uh, Sab. We're going to talk about um, Iga again mm-hmm. uh, and uh, go on from there. Sorry, Sabalenka. She said that she feels that Iga and Rabakina are helping each other, that she feels that all three are motivating each other to get better. Yeah. And that without them, it would be a little dry. But now that they're there, that they're pushing each other to make themselves better. Mm. What are your thoughts on that comment? I mean, it sounds like a very familiar tale. Um, Nadal, Djokovic, Federer, right? Federer starts taking his backhand early. Federer finds ways to hit his backhand down the line. Djokovic becomes an expert counterpuncher and a master of baseline core control and changing direction. Nadal masters... His uh, improving his serve motion, making his backhand more formidable, starts coming forward to the net a little bit more. Um, do these players, do any of them do any of these things if they don't have to beat each other? Probably not. You know, we saw what it looked like when Federer was kind of the, the lone wolf before the big three fully formed. And how many adjustments was he really making out there? 
you know, until he started losing to Nadal. And then I don't think he was really coming to the net until this might be a hot take. No one's ever said this out loud that I've heard. I think him coming to the net is a solution to beat Djokovic. I think his change of paces, the saber, the rhythm breaking, the not doing long exchanges from the baseline with a master of changing direction, that comes from trying to beat Djokovic. So um, I think that this is the exact same thing on the other end. You know, I love that Rabakina, Rabakina and Sabalenka's play styles are a little more similar, uh, but Iga... She's growing as a player having to deal with these monsters. Yes, so exactly. She, for me, is evolving the most out of the three. Yes, yeah, so um, just real quick, head-to-head. Head. She is now 7-3, and three, Iga versus Sabalenka. She's 7-3 and three now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sabalenka versus uh, Rabakina is 6-3. and three. Mm-hmm. And as I stated, uh, Rabakina is just a little more consistent to me than Sabalenka. Mm-hmm. So that's why she is 4-2 and two against Iga. Yeah. So now... Let's switch it around and talk about the poor uh, wolf left out, which is Coco Goff. Yeah. But she has a winning record against Rabakina and Sabalenka. Mm-hmm. They've only met once. Yeah. Uh, Rabakina and, Sab- and, and, sorry, and Coco Goff. Yeah. And, and she beat her. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, I'm not going to say, I'm going to say it. She's one in nine mm. against Mommy Iga. That's a crazy record. So that is a big gap. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Look, as much as we can talk about the one and nine gap, I would be fine with the gap being large if she can change the dynamic in their head to head in the current event status. The what have you done for me lately? If it turned into she's now five and nine and she won their four last meetings, we can talk about a big four. We don't have to necessarily acknowledge the head-to-head if you've been winning the majority of the current matchups. But she's still getting cooked out there, you right. know? Um, it's, not, it's not boding well for her. And if she makes it to more semis and finals, as she kind of has been um, over the last 12 months, then we can talk about if she has great records against Sabalenka and Rabakina that aren't just 1-2, and 0-1, oh stuff like that. We can have a conversation then about maybe styles make matchups and stuff like that. But I think Coco's got to kind of do what the other three are doing, which is grow your game and evolve so that you can be more relevant. You know, Coco's proven that the rest of the tour she can handle. Right. But that big three is the next animal she's got to tackle. And she's halfway there. Yes. So you think that as long as she keeps making more semis and more finals, then the head-to-heads won't matter, and now it could be considered a top four instead of a top three? No, what I'm saying is if she makes more semis and finals, she'll have more opportunities to strategize and hopefully beat some of them. Um, Like I said, if she gets to more semis and finals and she's beating Sabalenka and Rabakina and just losing to Iga, maybe there's an opportunity for conversation. Okay. If she can start beating Iga and still doesn't have a winning record versus Iga, I think it's an undeniable conversation. So she still got she still has plenty of work to do is what I'm saying. Okay, and then uh, Andy Roddick uh, chimed in, and then he said there's a big gap between those three and Coco. Yeah, but he did say that she is a second serve away from being right there. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Do you agree with Andy Roddick? Ah, uh, I I'm not in love with the guy forehand yet. Um, I think it has improved. I think it's going to keep improving. I think she's a second serve and a more aggressive dictating forehand away from being an undeniable big three. I think she surpasses Rabakina if she has a strong forehand and a strong second serve, which is so doable. That's so accomplishable for a pro athlete to develop a stronger forehand and second serve. We've seen several players on the tour do both of these things. So, I mean, look at Zverev. I feel like he's the prime example of that. There is yes, exactly. There is a prime. There is a. He's a prime example of incredible backhand, decent forehand, uh, double fault king. You know, and now we're talking about him being the dark horse at the French Open. You know, so there's there's opportunities there, and I think that she's young enough that it's a matter of time. That's true. Uh, I still would say big four, if that were to happen. Yeah. Uh, but her second serve. It kicks right into their forehands. Mm -hmm. So, yes, she needs a lot of work there. Mm -hmm. And we can go on and on about uh, her forehand. But Mm -hmm. Brad Gilbert made it a point 
mm. not to fix the lifting of the leg, mm. not to not to fix having an extreme Western grip just to hit flat. Mm. He said, we're going to work with what she has, and it, it has been working. Mm-hmm. So he, he said himself that he wasn't there to change stuff. It's just to make it better. Yeah, I'm not mad at that philosophy. I'm really not. I think that you don't need to have a flatter grip, per se, to have a better forehand. Right. So I, I'm right there with him on that. Yes. Yeah, so as long as she can fix the second serve, the serve in general. Yeah. Although she can serve bombs, she serves around 120. Mm-hmm. So uh, as long as she can fix that, she's going to be right there. Yeah. And now, uh, sad news to report, the end of Sissy Dosa. Mm-hmm. Paula Badosa broke up with Stefanos. Good for her. She she wrote, uh, he's the right guy, wrong time. Oh, one of those. <laughs> uh, do you think that was too diplomatic? Do you think it was oh, true? Oh, man. I think that it was the wrong guy and there wasn't a time. Um, but she's uh, she's clearly got a good soul and a good heart. Um, I'm happy for her. Um, I'm happy for her. And you know what? I'm happy for him also. Um, take that heartbreak and put it into an energy to win the French. That's the best I got for him. Um, but I'm I'm a hater, so I look. Th- I thought you were going to hate as you do on Casper Root. No, I, I'm learning to love. I'm trying to have a bigger heart for the tour. <laughs> um, look, and you, you overheard me on court recently saying these things, but I... I love CeCe Paz's actual tennis game. I think his game is pretty. Um, I think his forehand is incredible. I think that his overall style aesthetically is very pleasing. Um, I think he might have the weakest backhand in the top 10. But, you know, that's it's top 10. You know, so I, I respect CeCe Paz as a player. I'm just not a big, big fan of the the commentary and yes, what he's saying exactly. with media and what he's doing off the court and his antics. And I don't like those things. But as an actual athlete, I think that this is probably a positive for him, in my opinion. And I think that he's a great clay court player. So I hope this is fuel. So you're saying to me that you don't like it when he says, we take a shower to wash our problems away? I don't like anything he says off the court, to be totally honest with you. Um, I think Nikirios is a bully. I'm like, come on, man. You guys are professional athletes. If you think he's going to be your friend on that court, you are warped in the head. You know, I think that he says things that just let me know he's not fully there mentally as a pro athlete. Um, he confuses me with some of his statements. He thinks that people are supposed to be friends in match play. You're playing for a million dollars. That is your enemy out there. (laughs) Like, let's just be real. Uh, We here in rec play, um, when someone does something overly aggressive, we go, hey, you're not playing for money. Guess what? CC Pa, you are. That's true. Um, So, yeah, I think that, I think you want to talk about small changes to make a big difference. I think him becoming a more mentally sharp pro athlete makes him a top five athlete like that. Yeah, like I, that. I, I agree 100%. Mm. But I think I dived in too much into this, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, Paula Badosa is limited in the amount of time she has left uh, on tour, I, yeah. in my opinion. She's mm. had a lot of back problems. Mm. She's had uh, shots on her back. So she's limited to the amount of pro time she could have. Yeah. And it's probably a couple of years. Yeah. So she needs to focus Mm-hmm. On the task at hand. Yeah. So maybe it is wrong time. Maybe. I understand that. So okay. I, I, I tried to dive into it a little more. That's that's a nice, friendly analysis. I really like that, actually. Okay. You're right. And since we don't have a lot to talk about Sissy Pass, but we did speak on it off air, mm-hmm. I believe it was Patrick Martagliu mm-hmm. who said that Sissy Pass has the best forehand on tour. Mm-hmm. Do you agree with that? I don't. I don't. I think he probably has a top five forehand on the tour, but I don't think he has. I don't think his forehand is better than most players. I think that his forehand protects his backhand better than most players on the tour. But it's unfair to penalize players who just happen to have a good backhand too. <laughs> you know, like uh, look at the center forehand. It actually can hit through Novak Djokovic. Right. Have we seen CC Paz do that? No, because it's busy protecting his backhand, you know. So, 
it's little things like that that make it hard for me to agree. I think that he has a top five forehand. I think that he has an amazing forehand. I would compare his forehand to Felix Auger Aliasim's. Okay. Um, I think that their play styles are very identical. CC Podges has a much better service package. Um, his first serve and second serve are superior. That's um, that's fair. Yes. Um, as far as spot location, the second serve, the difference between CC Podges second serve and Felix's is night and day. Um, but that's who I would compare his forehand to. Those are two guys who, in my opinion, have very average backhands and can play top 10 level tennis. Yes, I'm not going to dig too much because you pretty much said uh, everything that needed to be said. But he is able to control on that cross court backhand. He's able to control it with his forehand if you Mm. do hit short and Mm. he will change direction on you to break that pattern. Yeah. And he's good at it. Yeah. So uh, if you look at it through that aspect, you can say, okay, yeah, his forehand's dominant. Mm-hmm. But if you look at it through other ways, I don't know. Uh, as you say, Sinner's more uh, penetrating. Yeah. Alcaraz has a very deep penetrating forehand as well. Yeah, so. absolutely. And you can't penalize them for not having to cover up a hole on the court. Right. You know, that's not fair to them. So I I think that he has a great forehand out of necessity for survival. Right, you exactly. Know? So now we're going to get to the big part of this, which is... Um, Masters 1000s used to be covered in about seven to eight days. Mm -hmm. So every single day, you're probably on a court. But now it's being extended over two weeks. Mm -hmm. And Rabakina, Garcia, they're not happy. Mm -hmm. They're saying, you're making the calendar too long. And Rabakina went as far as to say, that could be one of the reasons why Ash Barty stepped away from the game so early in her career. Mm Mm-hmm. Medvedev, on the other hand, said, I actually like the fact that it is two weeks long. He actually said, if you really look at it, it's really a week and a half. Mm -hmm. And I like the fact that you have one day on, one day off, one Mm -hmm. day on, one day off. So he likes that. Mm -hmm. But Rabakina and Garcia do not. Mm -hmm. Whose side are you on? I think I'm on Team Medvedev here. Um, I think that one day on, one day off is better. And if you are seated... Kind of like Medvedev said, if you're seated, you're not doing qualies. You know, you're not starting on Sunday of the first week. You know, the timing's a little different. And let if you're not winning the whole tournament, you're not playing the whole time. Um, I think that there's more rest time, and considering how long the tour is, you should really take advantage of these moments. So I'm I'm Team Medvedev. What do you think? Yes, I I agree. I actually like it when you do have a, a day in between mm-hmm. because there's times where you would see it in uh these smaller tournaments at the city open in washington mm-hmm. they're playing two games in one day and that is rough as well so i mean i get the point of it makes the calendar longer and their off season is shorter mm-hmm. but i would rather have them have one day on one day off than have them play in bunch yeah i Th- agree that's just my thought so now going on to the men so for the first time in tournament history, none of the top six men's seeds made it to the semifinals in Madrid. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Um, let's talk injuries, right? Let's talk injuries because that's that's a huge part of it. Um, our top three were all injured, right? Alcaraz, Sinner, Djokovic. Djokovic just didn't show up. Yeah, just didn't show up. Right. Uh, Sinner... So like half of them, I mean, this it's a loaded statement because half of them didn't even play, basically. Um, and then Rublev is now number six in the world after winning. Right. Uh, so I think it's a little bit of a loaded statement. I think that it's not as crazy as it sounds. Um, but it is, it is an interesting uh, factor because it speaks to the depth of the top ten on the men's tour, which I think there's some depth there. I think that... Uh, the guys that we thought were just hardcore specialists are showing up on clay. The guys who we thought only do well on clay are showing up on hard courts and grass courts. Um, the tour is looking really good right now. Yes, I agree. Mm. Yes, before I keep going, I forgot to mention this on the doubles the topic that we had. Corda and Jordan Thompson ended up winning Madrid. Woo-hoo. Two singles players playing doubles. Wow. So I guess there's a point of inviting more singles players into a doubles tournament. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah, singles players. We've always said this and know this. Singles players can come to doubles and succeed. 
double specialists cannot go over to singles and succeed. It's right. just been proven. So, I mean, this just speaks to that. Yes. So now going to Alcaraz, he withdrew from Rome as well with his uh, forearm issue. Mm-hmm. And so did Yannick Sinner with his hip issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, the French Open is weeks away. Do you think they'll make it? Um, I hope so. It sounds like Sinner is very much on the fence about what his health will be like from what I heard. He said, he very openly said, look, if I'm not 100% in contention of winning that event, I will not be showing up and I will focus on the big picture in the long term and not on chasing points now. Beautiful mindset. I agree with you 100% on that decision. Alcaraz, it seems more gray and ambiguous for me for as a spectator. I can't tell how serious this injury really is because he played great and lost to the guy who won the whole thing. Um, you know, and then also right after spoke about how, yeah, you know, this was bothering me. This was the situation. So I think Alcaraz will see the French. I do. Um, I think that he'll, he'll take this little bit of time before the French to heal up. He's got physio with him. He's got, he's got all the right people around him to help him heal at the right pace and speed. And also, I don't know if he wants to miss an opportunity to win a French open this wide open. That's true. You know, it's an opportunity for sure. That's true. So we're going to go to Nadal. Uh, prior to Madrid, he was outside the top 500. He was 507. Mm-hmm. After his run, he is very close to 300 mm-hmm. in the world. He is playing in Rome. Uh, his If he does it again, he can get probably around the 100 part to where he would automatically get a qualifier. Not that he needs one because they're going to accept him anyway. Yeah. But what are your thoughts on Nadal's uh, spike on the rankings? I have no I have no actual reaction to that because we already know a healthy Nadal's true ranking is top 100, you know. So for me it's his rankings irrelevant and he should be prioritizing health and peaking at the French Open. Try to make it to the French Open feeling good and feeling in the right mindset. And unless you're top 32, it doesn't matter what your ranking is. You know, you're going to go against very tough competition no matter what in the first round. So it is what it is. And you never know. He could get that Amarata Kanyu draw yeah. to where she didn't play a seed until the, what was it, quarterfinals or something along mm. those lines and win it. You just never know. Yeah. You just never know how the draw is going to play. Yeah. So, um, yeah, hopefully he does well in Rome and doesn't overexert himself and he'll, he'll be ready for the French. Yeah. So Andy Rod, and Andy Rod, excuse me, Andy Murray, mm-hmm. we knew that he had this freakish uh, uh, injury in uh, Miami. Yeah. He hasn't been playing. Uh, he's in a boot right now. And uh, he's saying that it's looking a little better. The rehab is getting closer. And hopefully he's able to return to the grass. Mm-hmm. That's where he really wants to play. Maybe the Olympics. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on uh, Andy Murray? Um, this, this injury might be a blessing in disguise for him. Uh, we talk about with other players how injuries extended their career because of the less court time. And I think maybe this is a great opportunity for him to be resting the hip and while he's healing the ankle, right? Yes. So I think that this is not necessarily a bad thing. Look, Andy Murray ain't a clay specialist. <laughs> you know, if there's ever a time for him to miss some tennis, it's right now. So we're, we, we love Andy Murray. We miss Andy Murray. I don't think the tour, this part of the season, needs Andy Murray. So this is a great time for him to rest. I hope he does get better in time for the grass, though, because that's when we want to see him. Right. That's when he can work that slice and his grinder style gets rewarded on grass because now his shots are naturally more offensive. So hopefully he makes it out there. Yes, I agree. So we're going to talk about the big ranking moves. Um, <clears throat> we had uh, Yuri Lahechka moving eight spots to 23 in the world. Uh, Rublev, after winning Madrid... He went up two spots, mm-hmm. and the biggest one is Ali Asim moving 15 spots into the top 20. He's been struggling a lot, and now he's in the top 20 with a uh, final mm-hmm. in Madrid. What yeah. are your thoughts on Ali Asim? You want my real thoughts? That's your uh, little brother, right? That's my boy. That's I, your boy? I, I love him, but let's be real here. He had three walkovers and one draw. Is that his responsibility or fault? No. But does it mean something in regards to how many points he collected in this event? Yes, it does. Um, 
I don't know if <clears throat> he showed up to that final just fresher and put up a great fight or if he's playing at a very, very high level right now and looking better. I'm not sure. Um, but I don't want to get too ahead of myself as a fan and supporter of him because three walkovers in one tournament and then making it to the final can be very tricky as far as perception goes. So I think time will tell with us um, how well he's really playing. But I think this is a great opportunity for him to walk away with uh, his morale high and his confidence built. And it was a heartbreaking loss. He put up a fight in that final. So we'll see what happens. But I'm not in love with the ranking change. I think that he still needs to prove to me that he can beat a tough draw of players all consecutively with no walkovers. He did have that big, big win versus Casper Rude, who has huge. been hot on clay. Yeah. But other than that, he beat Manorino, who has the lowest win ratio on clay. Yeah. In the circuit. Yeah. Obviously, you just said uh, Mensik. Yeah. He retired. Uh, then you have... Uh, the withdrawal in the quarterfinal center didn't even show up. Yeah. So there, there it is right there. Laheshka withdrew in the middle of the match. Yeah. So that's a lot of withdrawals. But again, you, he's there. Yeah, he's showing up. So he's showing up. So, um, yeah, I mean, what can you say? We just have to save our judgment. That's what's going to come down to. Right. And now, uh, Andre Rublev, what are your thoughts on him winning the tournament? Um, this is what he needed. He obviously was trying to protect points from a clay title he had from last year, this year, and he lost it. So this is a great opportunity for him to get those points back. Um, obviously, he was in a little bit of a slump ever since he had that meltdown. Um, and what was it, Dubai, Doha, or something like yes, that? Yes, Dubai, yeah. Um, so <laughs> this, is, this is good for him. I'm happy for him. We don't ask for much from Rublev during the clay swing. We don't need much from him. He got another title this year. And I will see him on another surface, <laughs> and I'm happy for him. Uh, I think that he can walk with confidence. And when they talked to him about why he played so well and what he did different, he just said his mind was at peace. He right. felt better mentally. And that's all it takes, so I'm happy for him. Yes, he um, he's a two-time uh, uh, champion, uh, Masters 1000 as well. Mm -hmm. And he overcame a four-match losing streak. Yeah. So that's pretty big as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, him overcoming the four-match losing streak? We know that wasn't going to last too long. This is a high-level player who's almost... We were almost branding him as Mr. Consistent quarterfinalist for a long time. And for him to have his first little slump in quite a long, long time, I think that he's good. I think that this is great for him. He is a human being. There is going to be deviation in performance. Him having a little bit of a slump during the clay season at that is totally understandable and the fact he got out of it in that same clay season he's gonna have a good year and as a matter of fact he is the first player in atp history to win a masters 1000 after having a losing streak of four in a row that makes sense that makes sense and if there's someone i thought could probably pull it off it's him i didn't think he'd do it on clay yeah. but i'm impressed and uh, just to review him he did lose to laheshka in the second round at Indian Wells. Mm. And then he lost his first match in Miami, mm. Monte Carlo, and Barcelona. Mm. And now he won the title. Yeah, so, I love it. So that is very, very impressive. Mm. So now we're going to go to retirements. Uh, first, we're going to talk about Diego. Diego Schwartzman announced his retirement. He said he is going to play this year and then retire in Argentina in 2025, yeah. just like Del Potro did. Hmm. What are your thoughts on your career, on the career of Diego Schwartzman? Uh, Diego Schwartzman had an amazing career. He earned the respect of every single pro athlete on the tour. This is a guy who went blow for blow with Rafa Nadal on clay, and he's like five seven. You know, um, you have to be a complete machine to be able to play at a level that high with a body that small. So. Um, I just don't think that playing at his body size at that level is sustainable for more than 10 years. So I I salute him. I congratulate him. I respect him. But I'm not mad at this retirement. I don't know if there's a second wind in someone who's got to play on such a physical tour now. You know, the guys at the top now are, I would say four or five of the guys at the top of the tour right now are clubbing the ball so hard. Um, I don't know if 
having those shorter legs and having to go blow for blow with those players match after match after match is plausible. Um, the grind is very hard. So I, I like his decision and I look forward to his retirement. Yes, he, he, okay. He broke a lot when he was playing. Mm -hmm. He was able to redirect balls as well. He got the most of what he had and he used it to his fullest potential. Yeah. And the fact that he didn't have a big serve and the fact that he kept winning matches was amazing. He beat Nadal at the Italian Open. Mm -hmm. uh, he's made a couple of semifinals uh, runs. He He's a good player. And uh, I will miss that uh, David story for sure. Mm -hmm. But this is an interesting retirement. Uh, Camila Giorgi, mm -hmm. she's a lingerie model and a tennis player. She just retired out of the blue. Yeah. Before I get to that, let me read you her accomplishments. She has four career titles, one WTA uh, Masters 1000, 2018 Wimbledon quarterfinal, and a career high of 26. Mm -hmm. So she was playing, and then all of a sudden, she didn't announce it. She just retired quietly. It was, it was on a list by the IPTA, and it read, Camila Georgi retired. She didn't even announce it. Interesting. What are your thoughts on that retirement? The <sighs> way she did it. You know what's funny? I'm not really mad at it because maybe she's just not looking to overly glorify her exit from the tour. You know, and she's clearly got other ventures going on where she's on the forefront and being spotlighted. And I'll be frank with you. Most of the time when people are talking about her, it's not for how well she plays tennis. You know, so I don't mean to be that guy, but um, congratulations to her for reaching the pinnacle of sports. Um, and being a professional tennis athlete on the tour and winning the matches she did win. But, you know, I'm not really upset at the way she exited. I don't think every single player who stops playing tennis needs this big farewell tour. You know, I think that she probably felt that she didn't need to make it a spectacle and that she's got other things going on. This is not the end for her and her identity is not just the sport of tennis. Yes, to me, it was just weird that she didn't even announce the retirement. At yeah. least announce the retirement. Maybe a tweet, at least. Yeah, something, <laughs> yes. Uh, she doesn't have to have a farewell tour, yeah. but announce it. And yeah. just the fact that she did it, it was, it was strange. Mm -hmm. Very strange. Maybe something happened off court we don't know about. Yes, exactly. And now the big, big retirement. The biggest what if, as you called him in a previous snippet, Dominic Team. He is retiring in Vienna this year. Oh, my goodness. A former U.S. Open champion. Maybe we can look up his uh, career stats and I'm, stuff. I'm looking him up right now but, uh, because this is a big deal to me. This but, is my guy. But what are your thoughts on the announcement by Dominic Team? My heart hurts, um, but let's be honest here. It's been tough. It's been tough to watch Dominic Team if you're a real Dominic Team fan. He's 2-7 and seven this year, year to date. And he's, I mean, he ran into CC Paul like three consecutive times in the last 12 months. So I get it, you know, and I really don't think he'll ever get back to that level he was at. And he's, is he Hall of Fame? He's Hall of Fame, right? Yes, I mean. Yeah, he's a Hall of Fame athlete already. He's got a Grand Slam already. That was always a criteria. Yeah. Um, not, here's why I think he's Hall of Fame. Yes, he has a Grand Slam. It's an asterisk Grand Slam, but a Grand Slam nonetheless. But on top of that, he's the guy who really went blow for blow with the big three and earned everyone's respect on the tour. Um, he was, if you're an Nadal fan, you feared Dominic Team in the draw. Um, I, I really think it sucks. I mean, this guy, he was kind of the, the face of the one-handed backhand, or he was going to be the future face of the one-handed backhand for all of us once we lost Dan Warinka and Feder and Gasquet. Right. He was that guy who was going to still carry the tour and stay in the top 10. So this is this is another Del Potro. This is a what if guy, you know? Yes, after that wrist injury, it, it's just been, he hasn't been able to recover. And for the most part, people in general, in the beginning, they were just saying, he just hits hard. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have a plan. Mm -hmm. But he was able to construct point by hitting that out wide forehand. Yeah. He would hit frozen ropes off of the backhand. Mm -hmm. And I would never thought that I would see the Stanimal on tour longer than Dominic Team. Me either. I thought Dominic Team was here to stay. Mm -hmm. It is very unfortunate on the the retirement. 
and he did have a lot to offer as you stated he had a, a very good record event against the big three and it's just sad to see the biggest what if quote unquote on his retirement uh i will go out with these last few statistics he is he had a career high ranking of three which is during the era of the big three right. that's incredible and also he has 17 titles there you go so yeah that that's a hall of fame career yes for sure and uh what do you think of diego it was is he a uh, hall of famer no he's not i think um he'll be remembered for his height <laughs> and, and what he did with it but i don't know if his accolades really add up to hall of fame i'm not sure about that i can double check but i i don't recall him having the same level of accomplishments that uh, Dominic team did. Are you looking up his career sets? Yeah, I had already okay. looked him up because I oh, know okay. he's 0 and 4 this year. But okay, yeah, he has four titles, career high ranking of number eight. That's impressive. That's impressive. Um, but yeah, he's 0 and 6 this year, and yeah, I think four titles just might not be enough. Okay, um, I don't think that's enough. Otherwise, we got to talk about putting uh, Ferrer, Burdage. Yeah, they're all there. There's a long line he's in the back of. That's okay. all I want to say. If okay. he's a Hall of Fame athlete. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I think that's everything. All right. In that case, I hope you guys were entertained. ATP, sorry about all the white noise, but uh, it will go away in our future episodes. We're on a new computer today. But yeah, see you guys next time.